Evening all. It's good to be here. Thanks, Nikki. Um, it is good to be here because actually the last time I was due to speak, um, I got out of it by having a heart attack and uh, spending the weekend in hospital. Uh, so I've not done anything quite so drastic tonight. Uh, decided to actually, you know, come and give my talk. Uh, it was a little bit of a shock, I have to say, back in May. Um, I'd been feeling pretty good. I had no warning signs, uh, popped home, had a heart attack, went to hospital, had a stent fitted, felt fine. A little bit weird. Um, but I tell you, one of the things that I was really uh, appreciative of that time was all the love and support uh, that just came pouring in. It was incredible. Um, Brother Andrew says that our prayers go where we cannot. There are no borders, no prison walls, no doors that are closed to us when we pray. Prayer takes us into places that we can't go. And um, within just a couple of hours uh, of having the heart attack, possibly even before I was uh, back on the ward after having the stent fitted, I'd had messages coming in from Australia, New Zealand, America, India, uh, and plenty from the UK as well. But it's incredible um, the love and the support that, that came in. And um, those prayers were and are very much appreciated. Um, the journey is probably still not over entirely. This week, actually, uh, it's probably quite a big week in terms of news of what the next steps are. Um, on Thursday, I've got to have a stress MRI test uh, so that they can see what damage uh, was done by the heart attack and uh, how bad the other um, arteries around my heart are. Um, on the day it happened, um, they told me that... Um, Two other of my arteries have been quite narrowed, and they were concerned. Um, as I uh, was discharged from the hospital a couple of days later, I was told that the damage to my heart was moderate to severe uh, in my left ventricle. So, um, your prayers would be appreciated. Um, it's quite interesting, you know, I, I've always wanted to be a walking miracle, so it'd be quite nice if I, uh, if I go to the scan and they find that my heart is fitted well, the arteries are completely clear, and the stent they put in has disappeared miraculously. That'd be quite nice. So you could be praying for that. Um, that would be good. Having something like a heart attack or any other um, potentially life-affecting or life-threatening incident is quite a revealing process. Um, I'd always hoped, and you're probably like this as well, you'd always hoped that um, you wouldn't fear in situations like that where there's the possibility for death. You wouldn't be afraid. You'd be thinking, I'm going to glory, um, or whatever it might be. You know, we, we can think about it and reason about it logically, can't we? That um, I'm saved. I have eternal life bought for me. Um, I don't need to fear death. And you, you know that. And then you hit a situation and you wonder whether you will or won't fear. And um, I wasn't fearful which is nice to be able to say. Um, but I don't think it particularly was uh, because I was thinking, yes, my life is secure and eternal life is secured. I think it's because I never thought that this was it. I never thought life was over. Um, and I think as I reflected on it, I had a month off um, after having had the heart attack. And as I was reflecting on it, as you do, you tend to think about these things. Um, I think part of the reason um, was because... I still think I have a purpose. Scripture tells us that um, we are made for purpose, um, and I still have a part to play. Now, that's not to say that I'm going to get to the end of my life having achieved everything I ever wanted, or all the dreams I've got are going to have come to pass, or all the promises of God over my life will have come to pass, because some of those are bigger than my own life and probably will span beyond my life. But I still feel there is a part for me to play. There is still something for me yet to do in the purposes of God. And it's certainly not that the heart attack wasn't serious. Um, it wasn't one of those things where you think, oh, I'm not going to die because it's not actually that bad. Um, on this side up here, that is the artery coming in and the blood just stopping at that point. Uh, and the next one, after they fit the stent, the blood flows quite nicely. Um, and once again, my heart is able to uh, have the blood and the oxygen that it needs. Um, so it, it seriously wasn't because it wasn't a minor, you know, it was just a minor thing. It wasn't a minor thing. Um, it is, I think, because I, I feel this sense of calling and destiny over my life. 
um, and I'm not done with it yet, which is good to know, hopefully. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, uh, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There is a plan for each of us, a purpose for each of us, a calling and a promise over us. And it's stated slightly different in different translations. Uh, in the New Living Testament uh, translation, rather, it says we are God's masterpiece. And that we've got good things to do instead of good works, but they were planned. In the NASB, we are his workmanship, created for good works, prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And it doesn't matter which version you go and look at, the reality is that we are created by God in Jesus to do good works or good things that God has prepared for us to do. There is no exception. There is no escape in it. There is no one here that can say, I don't have a purpose or I don't have a part to play in God's purposes. All of us have got work to do and it is good work. Work that we were created for. And we weren't just created in any haphazard way for it either. We are God's masterpieces. Masterpieces are not things that are a little bit shoddy, are they? Everyone knows what a masterpiece is. It's exceptional. Each of us has been created exceptionally well for the good works that God has prepared for us. Only I can do what God has planned for me to do. Only you can do what God has planned for you to do. We are his workmanship, his handiwork, which means he was intimately involved in our creation. His hands upon us, shaping us, forming us into his perfect masterpieces. I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me again. You're a masterpiece. I'm thinking about all of you too. I'm thinking about all of you too. But the truth is, no one and nothing could be better to do the work that God has in mind for you than you. No one and nothing that God uh, could do better work that God has in mind for me than me. And I love this verse because I know that I have struggled with it, uh, with this kind of thing. I've struggled with the tendency to compare myself to others, thinking I should have achieved more by now. I had my 40th birthday earlier this month. It's one of those milestones where you begin to think, what have I really done? What have I still got left to do? And you can get into, I, I had a friend who literally every year on his birthday he had a crisis like this. He began to think like that. And um, it was crippling, I tell you. If we find ourselves comparing ourselves to others and what other people have done and achieved or how they are, it becomes crippling to who God has made us to be. I can find myself sometimes, you know, not only wishing I could have achieved more, but wishing I had the traits or skills or opportunities and fortune of others. And I have to remind myself that if God didn't need me to be part of his plans, he wouldn't have made me. There's no point comparing ourselves to other people and thinking, if only I were more like them. Because if God wanted us more like them, he would have made two of them and not one of them and one of me or one of us. I could wish I was more like Nikki. The ability to woo people, to win them over. But to be honest, if I was doing that, I'd be doing her job. <laughs> I'd be doing her work. And I wouldn't be fulfilling what God has got for me. I could wish I was more like Paul and had you know, influence and opportunity in the city. But let's be honest, that creates a lot of work. And we don't need twice that, do we? <laughs> Imagine what this church would be like with two Paul Woodmans. <laughs> Paul might think it's the dream, but <laughs> the rest of us. Whew. Or I could wish I was more like Katie having that ability to dance like she does. I'm more like Hannah, being able to sing the way she does. But to be honest, I'd probably look and sound a bit strange if I was a bit like them. I could wish I had, you know, a good, thick head of manageable hair like Andy at the back over there. I can't say anything wrong with that wish, actually. I'm, 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 I'm wanting that one. But the truth is that there's nothing wrong with wanting some more of these things. I might want to have... Uh, the ability to win over, over, win others over. I might want to have more influence. I might want to be able to dance better and have better hair. I'm not sure that one's going to happen. It's, it's thinning, if anything. Um, but I, I sh my desire for those things shouldn't be, I wish I was more like Nikki or more like Paul or more like anybody else. Because the reality is, if I pursue those things in God, if I pursue uh, influence or the ability to win other others over, I can't say that tonight, can I? Or wanting more wisdom, I shouldn't be thinking I want wisdom like Bev. I want wisdom like something higher than Bev. I want the wisdom of God in my life. 
I want the ability that God has to win others over. I want his level of influence. And I may not have it quite up to that level, but that is surely what we should be aspiring to, not comparing with others who have a different calling, a different purpose, and are created as their own masterpiece for that calling. I want to encourage us because we are each perfectly and wonderfully made for the good works that God has in store for us. We are the good works of God. We are his masterpieces made to do good works. We get to replicate the good stuff that God has put in us. We get to take that into the world. I want to encourage us to not fight it, to not pursue uh, being like somebody else, but to be encouraged to be ourselves. No one else can be you. No one else can be me. And we are necessary to the plans and purposes of God. So these good works that are prepared for us fit primarily, uh, I guess, this is our, our nice, neat new vision document. You can grab copies out the front if you haven't got one. Um, but they fit primarily in our missional discipleship and our creative solutions strands. These good works are the kind of outward expression, if you like, of what God has done in us. And they are an expression of our uh, passionate worship for God, but they are about going beyond ourselves and beyond our relationship with God to impact and affect and influence others. Our work is purposeful. It is to replicate heaven on earth. It's the same task that Adam and Eve effectively were given in the garden. Um, God basically came to them and said, here is a perfect paradise garden. Take what you see, take what you have in yourselves and go and replicate it in the rest of the earth. Tame that which is wild. Bring order from chaos. Replace the turmoil with peace. Overcome what looks like despair with hope. Conquer any fear with love. You know, when we aren't living aligned with those purposes that God has for us, we find, uh, and those things that we're made for, uh, when we begin to try and maybe live like others or, you know, try and be somebody we're not, we find, maybe subtly at first, but we find uh, that we miss out on the fulfillment that God has for us. We can trick ourselves into thinking we've got that through other things, but we tend to find we lose our peace. Hope begins to diminish. Faith is lowered, and we miss out on our purpose and our satisfaction and our joy. But more than that, because each of us has a part to play and we're part of a body together, if we don't do the thing that we're called to, the body misses out. The purposes of God miss out. It says here in Ephesians 4.16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. There is a real responsibility on each of us to live out the calling that God has on us. So not try and live like somebody else, but to live out who we are called to be, to step into the good works that God has prepared for us. Because if we don't do our bit, other people miss out and the world lacks. If I don't do my bit, it says that others won't grow in the same way. The body won't be as healthy and love will be slightly less than full. Each of us contributes. Your contribution is missed if it's not brought. God created us perfectly suited to do the good works. Nobody else can do it. We all have to do our part. So what does that look like? What does it look like for each of us? It will be different. We are unique. But I think understanding what our passions are, understanding what our natural talents are, looking at the spiritual gifts maybe that God has given us and graced us with, how do our spiritual gifts match with our natural talents? Are there ways in which they sit on top of one another? What opportunities do we have for us that meet with our passions? Because I think it's as we look at some of those things, we begin to find the thing that causes our heart to sing and we begin to find some of that purpose and the good works that maybe God has for us. And I'd like to encourage us to maybe explore some of those things. If you don't know what those good works are, if you're not sure what that calling is, spend some time. Ask God, well, what is it that I'm really passionate about? What makes my heart sing? What am I actually good at? How does that fit with the opportunities I've got and where God has placed me? In... Um, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, uh, Paul writes this. 
It's quite long. I'll read it quick. He says, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, Philetus, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, right at the beginning um, of what Paul wrote there, there was an encouragement to keep reminding one another of these things. It's not an individual sport. We're designed to do this together as a body, as a team. It goes on to explain that a pure heart and pure living allows us to be used by God in extraordinary ways for special good works. Works we were made for. Works that will ultimately bring us uh, joy and fulfillment as well. But it's clear also, I think, from the beginning of the verse that our pure heart and living is not just about our actions, but stems from our identity in Christ. Demonstrated by right belief in the finished work of Jesus and his promises towards us. You know, we present ourselves before God as an approved worker because that is what we are. We have been approved before we've done anything. Before we go into service, we're approved for it. In right belief about what Jesus did on the cross, the resurrection power at work in our own lives, the eternal nature of our future, uh, and many other things, the promises we've got over us, we are enabled then to live pure lives. It begins to flow from our identity. It's not the other way around. Trying hard to be pure in order to be used by God is not grace. It works and it fails. But the opposite of living pure lives is also true. You know, if we engage in godless chatter, the scripture says, believing less than the truth, then we begin to live like it. We begin to become more and more ungodly. The identity that we live with is of vital importance. If we are truly to step into the good works that God has created for us, the masterpiece that you are to do the works that God has created for you, and the masterpiece that I am to do the works that God has created for me, I need to understand my identity in that. I need not be insecure looking around at others, but understand that God has placed in me something only I can bring into the situation. A fine dish does not have to serve countless meals to be seen as fine. That's right, isn't it? It was made fine. It was created a fine dish for purpose to serve meals to honor guests. That's where that scripture ends. And there's, there's a story of a famous art collector who was walking uh, through the city when he noticed a mangy old cat. This, this isn't very mangy. It's actually quite a cute cat. And I don't, I don't really like cats, but it's quite cute. Um, but he was walking through the city and he noticed this mangy cat lapping milk from a saucer in the doorway of a store. And he did a bit of a double take because being an art collector, he recognized that the saucer was both very old and very rare and extremely valuable. So he walked casually into the shop, had a little browse, picked up some stuff that wasn't really worth anything, um, wandered over to the store, and over, store owner and uh, offered to buy the cat. So I'll give you, I'll give you $2 for the cat. It's in America. Um, and, and I'll buy these other things as well. Uh, the store owner replied, he says, I'm sorry, but I can't sell you the cat. It's not for sale. The collector was like, oh, I've got to get this. I've got to get this source. Oh, please, I, I need a hungry cat around the house to catch the mice. I live in a place that's not very nice, and I really need a cat like this. I'll pay you $20 for the cat. 
Shop owner turns around and went, sold. Cat is yours. The collector continues, says, as I'm paying quite over the odds and giving you $20, would you just throw in that saucer? You know, the cat's used to it. It'll save me having to get one. Uh, and the store owner says, no, no, I can't give you that. That's my lucky saucer. 16th cat I've sold today. <laughs> Bit of a dish theme uh, today. But, you know, <laughs> our identity and value are important. And uh, we need to discover the true reality of it so that we don't waste what we can bring. You know, a plate fit for a king sat on a floor uh, with a mangy-tongued cat stuck in it. Yeah, the shop owner's getting $20 here and there, but that's not what it was made for. It's not realizing the true value or the true potential of what it is. If we don't grasp our true identity as children of God, sons and daughters of the king, that impact lives and nations, having privilege, authority, and power, bringing lasting transformation, releasing hope. If we don't grasp those things, then we're likely to get deceived into believing something less than that. We find that maybe we don't really believe the value that's been placed upon us that we've been created for, and we will end up doing those things um, that are less than our true calling. We'll miss out on those good works. It flows from identity. There's another story uh, in, in 1799, uh, 50 years, this was before the California gold rush, um, gold was discovered in North Carolina in a small town called Stanfield in Cabarrus County. There was a little 12-year-old boy. He found a nugget weighing 17 pounds. That's a big nugget of gold. Uh, he took it home, uh, and his father, John Reed, didn't know what it was, so he used it as a doorstop for three years. In 1802, he took it to a market uh, in a place called Fayetteville, and a jeweler recognized that the doorstop was gold, and he bought it for $3.50. And now I worked out what you know, inflation was, and that works out as about $65 in today's money, which is not very much, considering that currently, I've looked into it, you know, I'm thinking, about it, thinking of investing now. Uh, one kilogram of gold bullion currently is selling for close to $42,000, one kilogram. 17 pounds would be worth just over $350,000. A hundred times, well, several hundred times, 100,000 times uh, more than what John Reed received. Now, yeah, it wasn't gold bullion, it was a gold nugget, but it was worth more than $3.50. The gold, of course, was no less valuable because of its purchase price. And I've no doubt that jeweler went on and made a fortune. The issue was not the value, but that the value wasn't recognized. And the sale was made uh, in line with a lie. Our identity is not solely about who we are. It's about how we live out who we are. And we can only live out who we are when we understand that value. There are good works for us to do. We were created for them. The world is waiting and watching in eager expectation, longing for liberation into the freedom and glory that we as the children of God get to live out each day. That's what it says in Romans 8, 19 to 21. So I want to encourage us, let's firmly grasp hold of the truth of what Jesus has done dying on the cross, purchasing our lives and paying the debt for all our failings, giving us a hope and a future, bringing us into the family of God so that we can live as royal children, masterpieces created with purpose and inheritance and access to all the resources of heaven. This is the truth about our lives. May we then step into those good works that God has prepared for us, the ones that we were perfectly created for, gifted for, are passionate about, and in Jesus are empowered to do. Works that will bring us satisfaction and joy, that cause us to bring our contribution to the body, joining with the business of our Heavenly Father in establishing His kingdom where we are, seeing healing triumph over sickness, provision over lack, hope restored to the hopeless, peace replacing anxiety, love driving out fear, joy conquering despair, and life defeating death, because they are the works of God that he has for us. For we are God's masterpieces, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So my encouragement, let's go do it. I'm going to hand back to Nikki.